Tonight, uh, we're going to be talking about charcoal. Why charcoal? A lot of people don't know about it. Some know a little. And I was one of those that knew nothing and then found out a little. And then over the last few years, I found out a lot, especially uh, when I had the privilege of hearing this presentation. I did not create this presentation and neither did my husband, but uh, by the end of the night you'll know who did and you'll know why I'm up here. Um, I'll start with uh, the first beautiful slide. You are the gatekeeper of your health and for all of us it's true unless we're not mentally capable, we make our decisions on what we're going to do. A lot of men, older men especially, no, I'm not going to the doctor. <laughs> they have to be nearly dead to go to the doctor. Um, but we decide when we're going to, what we're going to do, how we're going to approach feeling ill. <sighs> it's an important question where you begin to look at how you're going to treat yourself if something goes wrong. Now, the question to ponder is, uh, do you have to be wealthy to be healthy? Yeah, there's a, that's a deep subject, but um, do you think God only loves rich people? No. He's got a very simple formula for health, and um, I'm praying that this week you're learning some of the simple principles. When I decided to give this talk, I wanted to add a thought to it, so I jumped on the internet and instantly found exactly what I was looking for within one second. I couldn't believe, I don't even know what I typed in, but it, up it came. And it was a uh, presentation that an insurance company was giving. It was um, about health care costs in the United States. Health Care Solutions Summit. You know, employers are always worried about how much health care is being spent. and um, So I jumped on and found this, a few slides, which, which encased my point. It's interesting here. 75% uh, of total health care spending in the U.S. It's, it's from common preventable chronic conditions. That's, that's three-fourths. And further down it says lifestyle choices are major reason for chronic conditions increasing. Most chronic conditions are preventable. So I guess this is widely known. And that is uh, the whole reason why my husband and I are doing what we're doing. We want to help people. So, the next slide, they break it down and they give, you know, four little principles here. People who don't smoke, lose weight, get exercise, and stick to a good diet have almost 80% lower risk of developing chronic diseases. You know, those are pretty easy concepts to get, right? And they broke it down 93% lower in diabetes, 81% lower heart attack, stroke, cancer. But this is what I really wanted you to think about. Most people don't care about how much health care costs because they're really not spending their money on it. I know you have co pays and you have deductibles. But have you ever had to pay for an actual hospital bill or the whole doctor bill yourself? It is astronomical. And I know, I used to work, I managed doctor's practices, I worked in hospitals and uh, surgery centers, and it, the bills are astronomical. And most of us don't care because the insurance pays for it, or Medicare pays for it, or somebody else is paying for it. It, we, we would really think again if we had to pay for it. And that was the point I wanted to put in there. So like we've all heard the law of gravity. You throw something up, 
it comes down. That's just the law. Well, there are health laws, and there are basically eight health laws. And I can assure you that if they're neglected or broken, ignored, however you want to look at it, illness results in one form or another. And it's, it's very easy to, even a child can understand the, the health laws, the, the simple, you know, they're common sense things that most of us would know. Drinking your water, getting your sleep, you know, uh, getting some exercise, you gotta get fresh air, uh, eating healthfully, you know, good nutritious diet, and avoiding things that are bad for you, like alcohol and cigarettes and stuff like that. And then there's one law that's to do with stress, and that is a huge one, and we won't have time to even touch that, but stress is a big one for us. Um, our minds worry, our minds uh, fear, they regret, they're uh, unforgiving and bitter about past events. Um, they have a tremendous impact on our health. Um, and I wish we could give you a stress seminar, but we can't. It's available on our resource table. But tonight, we're going to talk about medicinal charcoal, God's humble doctor. Now, I'll start by giving you some background on charcoal. Historically, charcoal was first used in Chinese fireworks, and it's still used today in all the pyrotechnics. Then the Chinese developed gunpowder with charcoal after they invented the fireworks. And charcoal is still used in gunpowder today. Now many of you are aware that, uh, you know, water is filtered with charcoal. Has anybody ever heard that? Okay. It is true. All bottled water is filtered with charcoal. But did you know this? Back in 450 BC, they have been able to show, all the way back then, that voyagers, when they would cross the oceans, were using wooden barrels, like something like that. And what they would do is they would scorch the inside of the wooden barrel and then put their water in. And that water would stay good for months and months and months. Uh, I don't know how they figured that out, but they figured that out. And if for some reason it would go rancid or bad, they also knew that if they just got some fresh charcoal from a fire and put it in that barrel, it would clean it right back up again. That's uh, going all the way, they have records back to 450 BC on that. Today, charcoal is used for all kinds of things. Aquariums, we've probably heard of aquariums, you get the little fish, uh, the black charcoal filters for the, well, fish, what they do is they put off nitrates, and nitrates, algae grows on nitrates, and that's why you get all that scum and, and uh, inside aquariums, and the charcoal keeps that from forming and cleans up the nitrates. And um, they use uh, not just little aquariums, but giant aquariums like SeaWorld use charcoal. So charcoal is definitely used that way. Bottled water, all bottled water is uh, filtered through charcoal. And here's something to ponder. How do you take something that's dirty, water, um, and filter it through something that's black? You know what charcoal is. It's black, messy stuff. And then it makes crystal clean water. Isn't that intriguing, interesting? A little mysterious almost, how that works, but it does. Now they also use it in swimming pools, including Olympic swimming pools. And anybody recognize this uh, picture? Outer space, yeah. Well, up there, you might realize there are no water faucets. There's no, <laughs> there's no air. Um, when you get out in space, you, they have to get that water and air up there, right? Anybody can, can anyone guess how much 
approximately, just a guess, how much does it cost to get one pound of water into the space station up there? Any guesses? $10,000. Well, that's a little less. That's a good guess, though. It's about $1,000 a pound. So your, your gallon is eight pounds. Your gallon jug would be $8,000 for water. Now, do you think they just flush it out, flush, flush down with, out into space? They don't. They reuse that water over and over and over and over. And it's with charcoal that they clean it up. You could not go to space without charcoal. It's the same with air. They have to get the air up there. And they reuse that air over and over and over again. So uh, that's pretty valuable water and air, I'd say. And I'd want to keep reusing it, too. But they, the technology is true. It's charcoal does its, uh, well, mysterious thing. Now, uh, submarines. Submarines come to a screeching halt without charcoal. Down there, the carbon dioxide levels increase very rapidly, and they use charcoal to scrub out carbon dioxide. Um, charcoal is used in foods, uh, food colorings, and um, any guesses which jelly bean has the charcoal in it? <laughs> it's the black one, isn't it? Well, charcoal is also used in uh, filtering liquids and, and, and juices, even um, grape juice and wine and stuff like that. Any guesses in this picture which one is filtered for charcoal? It's actually the, the lighter one. They cleaned it up with, with sure. charcoal. Um, it's used in makeup. We probably all would recognize that. Eyeliner, mascara, your ink pens when you write. That is charcoal as well. Uh, fine vegetable oils, they use that. Uh, they use charcoal to clean that up, to clean up its odor, even clean up rancidity, um, even flavor issues, color issues. They use charcoal with that. They use it to make pharmaceuticals nice and white and clean, which uh, this seems kind of obvious. Now, OSHA, the EPA, that's the Enver Environmental Protection Agency, uh, made regulations to start next year, 2013. And they are going to be using charcoal to clean up emissions out of big factories and plants so that our air will be cleaner. <coughs> um, it's already you know, regulated, but they're going to get much tighter on it. And that's another area where um, these are coal fire generators have charcoal beds to clean out the sulfites and, uh, and everything else they don't want out of, out of their emissions. So charcoal is used that way. Now the beer industry, they capitalized on the idea of charcoal and carbon dioxide. And when they're making their beer, they have uh, carbon dioxide what do you call it, coming off of it, and they, what they did was they captured that and then moved it over to the other side of the plant. So they took this carbon dioxide that they got off the processing uh, for making beer, and they are utilizing it to make a drink that almost every American drinks. And guess what that is? That's carbonated drinks or soda. Carbonation, you see? Mm -hmm. Carbon dioxide. So, um, carbon filters charcoal is used in vacuums <coughs> and commercial vacuums to clean out air and stuff like that. It's used in those hybrid cars, uh, in the fuel cells, and um, gas masks. Masks. Now, we're probably somewhat familiar with this mask here from all our world wars. Well, back in uh, World War One and World War Two, they were having problems with mustard gas killing people, and somebody thought, "Hmm, let's try this," and it works. 
and it saved lives. They started making those masks, which utilized charcoal. Um, what people might not know, you might not know this, and I did it before, is that's kind of a gruesome picture there, but they're using carbon or charcoal now in their uniforms to protect them from chemical warfare, biological warfare, and also it protects you from radiation, believe it or not. So there is um, cloth and clothing that has carbon weaved in it that you can get um, that protects you from things like that. They certainly use it in the military. And this mask here, nice mask to have. I know where you can get them. I have one. It's a carbon mask or charcoal mask. And it does everything that this mask does, only it's feather light. And they use that in laboratories, and they use it in hospital settings. And um, it's just another, or we, you know, we see many different masks. Of, surgeons have masks. And they have these black ones now, carbon masks. Well, those are just a few of the applications that we use charcoal today. Um, both of regular charcoal and activated charcoal. And I'll be explaining what activated charcoal is because you might have come across that and it's something you'll want to know. You can see there's uh, all kinds of applications and this company here says a thousand applications today and a thousand and one tomorrow. They are just thinking of all kinds of things of how to use this technology. Medicinal charcoal, what about it? Well, let me give you a little bit of background because this, this is where it comes in contact with us as humans. We all know what mummies are. We've heard of Egypt and the Egyptian mummies and stuff like that. Well, originally, uh, Egyptians found that if they could bury their dead in layers of sand and charcoal, they could preserve their dead people. And because of their beliefs of afterlife, that was important to them to preserve the body. So where did they ever get the idea of, of applying charcoal? It is speculated that they went out and looked in the forest and observed that after a forest fire, those burnt stumps were standing and standing and standing and remaining intact much longer than the other non-burnt trees that would die and turn back into dirt, right? It decomposes and rots away, and yet the charcoal would remain. And they probably thought, isn't that interesting? Um, they, they just, that's probably where this idea was originated with. And so they started using it, and it worked for their, um, burying their dead, and then they took it further and they developed an embalming uh, process where the embalming of rubbing the body with um, whatever they used, <laughs> it had charcoal in it as well and worked brilliantly. But that goes back a long way, so we're talking Egyptian days. And here's a uh, little more contemporary quote I wanted to show you. It's. Um, in 50 AD, this is after the death of Christ, a Roman scientist by the name of Pliny, I don't know how to pronounce it, Pliny, Pliny, he said this, it is only when ignited and quenched that charcoal itself acquires its characteristic power, and only when it seems to have perished that it becomes endowed with greater virtue. He was describing a mystery that modern science of the 21st century capitalizes on every single day now. Moving up a little forward in time to uh, 1813, Michael Bertrand was a French pharmacist or chemist, and in front of a, a much larger group than we have here tonight, literally hundreds of scientists in his day, he picked up a bottle of arsenic and drank it in front of everybody. And then, immediately after that, drank down 
his charcoal potion that he had made and stood before everybody and absolutely nothing happened to him. He had, he had drank enough of this arsenic that would kill 150 men. And that's usually acutely, severely painful and vomiting and you name it, and they die. So nothing happened and it was, it was a, a quite historic event. A little bit, not much later, Another scientist, um, Pierre There, took 15 grams of strychnine, that's enough to kill 10 men, and did the same thing. Charcoal, he didn't suffer even a stomach ache. Um, they didn't try this without first trying it on their little uh, guinea pigs, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, they were proving that there's something to this. Now here is a little bit more contemporary slide I'd like you to read. I'll read it with you. Charcoal mixed with breadcrumbs or yeast has long been a favorite material for forming poultices among army and navy surgeons. The charcoal poultice has also obtained a high character in hospital practice as an application of sloughing ulcers and gangrenous sores. And recently, this substance has afforded immense relief in numerous cases of open cancer by soothing pain, correcting photor, that's an old English word for odor, and facilitating the separation of the morbid structure from the surrounding parts. It is unnecessary to mention other instances of its utility, and in this form, charcoal is now admitted into the London Pharmacopoeia and is in general use in all naval, military, and civil hospitals. Isn't that interesting? I never knew any of this before. I thought that was just fascinating. This is a surgeon, James Bird, 1857, he wrote that. Um, that is how popular regular charcoal was in the treatment of many different diseases 150 years ago. So now what about today? Before we get to today, here's another statement uh, from a contemporary of Dr. Bird, and I'll read this to you. One of the most beneficial remedies is pulverized charcoal, placed in a bag and used in fomentations. This is a most successful remedy. If wet in smartweed boiled, smartweed is not marijuana, it is a <laughs> herb or weed that is uh, known to help with pain. It's an analgesic Smart. herb. So if wet in smartweed boiled, it is still better. I have ordered this in cases where the sick were suffering great pain. And when, and when it has been confided to me by the physician, that he thought it was the last before the close of life. Then I suggested the charcoal, the patient slept, the turning point came, and recovery was the result. This was actually written by a health reformer back in 1897 by the name of Ellen White. Um, she went on to say to students when injured with bruised hands or suff and suffering inflammation, I have prescribed this simple remedy with perfect success. The poison of inflammation was overcome, the pain removed, and healing went on rapidly. The most severe inflammation of the eyes will be relieved by a poultice of charcoal. Put in a bag and dipped in hot or cold water as will best suit the case. This works like a charm. Now, uh, by the end of this program tonight, you will see that uh, the, the, the reason why charcoal is known as a universal antidote for poisoning and toxins. The FDA rates charcoal as category one, safe and effective for poisoning. Um, it's the first thing they do when you get to the emergency room and you've had an accidental poisoning or overdose. They're using charcoal. Now, the lady who wrote that last slide was writing 
to a doctor. This doctor was quite famous in his day. You might know him because of uh, something else he was associated with, which we have in our grocery stores everywhere. Who's heard of Kellogg's Corn Flakes? We all have, right? Cereal? Well, John Harvey Kellogg was a physician back at the turn of the century, in the eight, late 1800s, early 1900s, and he was a medical director for a sanitarium. It's called Battle Creek Sanitarium in Michigan. And his center back in the day, the who's who of the world knew about it and went there. Presidents of our country, kings and queens of Europe, famous movie stars, famous Olympian athletes would go and seek his help. He was a phenomenal surgeon and physician. He knew Ellen White personally. She had had a tremendous influence on his life. And she wrote him this interesting comment. I expect you will laugh at this, but if I could give this remedy some outlandish name that no one knew but myself, it would have greater influence. <laughs> She's talking about charcoal. And, uh, and certainly the reaction I've gotten and seen before when you start talking about charcoal, it's like, huh? Well, I want to tell you, medicinal charcoal is not burnt toast, okay? It's not burnt food, it's not charcoal briquettes, and it works for a lot of things, but it is not a cure-all. And I'll just take this moment here to tell you that there's only one tremendously important side effect it has that you need to know about. If you take charcoal internally with medication from your doctor, it will remove that medication. So you, you would want to take it at least two hours before or after you take that medication. So, and, and just to mention too about the burnt toast, some people associate charcoal with burnt food, which we know have heard it is carcinogenic to eat burnt, you know, charcoal food. It's charcoal is not that, and that is cancerous, and it's it's mostly that cancerous stuff is your burnt fats, burning on the grill and turning black, you know, when you blacken your meat and grilling. That is definitely carcinogenic or cancer causing. But charcoal is is uh, we'll get to what charcoal is. Medicinal charcoal in the 21st century. Now I'm going to go back to the slide that I had showed you before because it's interesting in that this slide right here, this little image of that baby. Who here has ever been around a baby that has colic? Oh, I see one. So there you go. And you know what that's like, right? It is so miserable because when that baby is crying and miserable, everyone around that child is miserable. And, and it is sleepless nights, it's, it's just horrendous. Well, the, the inventor of this remedy was a woman in, in our day here. She was a pharmacist and she had a baby. And her baby had colic and she was pulling her hair out. What can I do for my child? I can't believe this. There must be some remedy I can give this baby to help. And she, she just pulled her hair out and, and tried everything she could think of and discovered something very important that I'm going to share with you. Is she figured out that very tiny amounts of charcoal, along with what she's created her own formula, it's got some herbs in there as well, but it helps with the gas that the baby's having and quiets them down immediately. It sells the gas. And that's what causes colic and the, that's what colic is for a baby. They've got tremendous gas and pressure in their stomach and it's just killing them. And this remedy works. So much so that this woman who was a pharmacist is now a multi-millionaire. 
maybe even billionaire. She is her she takes out one hundred thousand dollar ads for her her thing. Um, so if you ever know somebody that has a colicky baby, just remember that. And I had one. My son went through six weeks of it, and uh, it it really helps. Now, in the hospital, they are using charcoal behind the scenes. Uh, certainly, like I said, the poisoning, with drug overdose, when you get into the hospital there, the first thing they do, whether you're conscious or not, if you're unconscious, they pump it into your stomach, wait a certain amount of time, and then pump your stomach out. And they'll even do that several times to, to get the, uh, whatever it is that's poisoning you. Um, they use it in dialysis, they use it in wound dressings, they're using it uh, in all kinds of ways, anemia of cancer. And uh, anyone here who has heard of dialysis? Almost everyone is kind of familiar with dialysis. Dialysis is, is being used most commonly, we know of kidney dialysis when kidneys fail. They use it for liver dialysis as well. It's when your kidneys and liver are no longer able to clean your um, body up, and so they have to clean it to keep you alive. So they take your blood and they run it through a machine. That machine is cleaning with charcoal. So when you think about charcoal and you're tempted to ask, but doesn't it remove the nutrition out of my food? No, it does not, because these dialysis patients go in at least three times a week when they're in complete failure. And uh, they're not getting malnourished from their charcoal, uh, their blood being cleansed by charcoal. Now, poisoning. How many kids this year will be poisoned? I hate to think of it. Uh, lots of them. And some survive, some don't. Kentucky decided in 2001, they did a study on this, but they, they did a media blitz. They wanted every single home in Kentucky to have charcoal in hand because they knew it saves lives. And so they, you know, the government paid for it and, and got everybody on board with this and a lot of homes had the charcoal in it. And then they did the study and they looked at 138 cases of home poisoning. And um, the average treatment at home was 38 minutes, which is very good. You'd like it to be under 30 minutes. 38's okay. Um, and they saved millions in medical costs is what they were concerned about. But I'm sure they saved hundreds of lives as well. It was a very significant um, study they did. You hope you never have to use it, like a fire extinguisher, right? You hope you never have to use it. But isn't it nice to know and have in case you do? Um, they say that the reason people get killed in fires is because they don't have a plan. Uh, it's good to have a plan. And if you don't have charcoal in your home, I highly recommend you start thinking about it. It can save lives. And um, there's other things you want to use charcoal for. We'll get to that. Here's just a tiny list. They say, some lists say 4,000, some say even up to 6,000 man-made and natural poisons, toxins that charcoal is known to absorb. Now I'm using the word adsorb, that's A-D, A and D is a dog. This is not absorb like a sponge, which is A-B. It's adsorb. What that means is that the charcoal somehow has the toxins attached to it and then doesn't let them go. It, it just grabs onto the toxins and hangs onto it. You would have to heat that charcoal up to like 800 degrees Celsius to get it to let go. So when you take it by mouth, it just goes all the way through you and comes out the other end. That's how it's taking it out of you. We also use charcoal 
on the outside to pull out poisons. We'll go into that in a minute. This was a study um, they did in 1986. They wanted to see what it would do, and lo and behold, look what it did. Two tablespoons, three times a day for four weeks. And they found it lowered cholesterol. Isn't that interesting? It, it uh, lowered it by 25%. It did the LDL down by 41%. It doubled the ratio of the good and bad um, cholesterol. And it took the triglycerides down as well. It's a significant study. If you are tempted to try this to get your charcoal, uh, your cholesterol down, just a word of warning. Some people get a little bit constipated if you're taking that much charcoal. Uh, no problem. Just drink lots more water and eat high fiber foods, prune juice, prunes, and eat lots of fiber and you'll be fine. That is one very slight side effect some people feel is a little, if you're going to take tons of it, you will get a little bit constipated. Well, let's talk about medicinal charcoal. Why would you want to use it? Um, we touched on gas from babies. It certainly helps for gas in your stomach. Um, I wanted to show you this. Iatrogenic death. Here's something to ponder. When you go into a hospital and you end up dying not because of the illness, they call that iatrogenic death. It's usually errors um, of some sort. Uh, somebody's done something incorrectly. Or it also could be infections that you got while in the hospital, meaning they gave them to you. And, um, they, uh, it's also negative effects of properly prescribed drugs. As a matter of fact, that's the largest one. And that's kind of scary. They're prescribing a drug just like it should be. You took it and just like it should. And people die. There's, there's side effects to medication. And um, just something to think about. It's very sobering. Now, nosocomial infections, that's an infection that you acquire while in the hospital. This is huge. Post-op infections, and um, usually it's post-operative, but it also can be once in a while you go in with a wound and you come out with an infected wound. Um, yes, what am I trying to say? Uh, 110,000 will die this year from infections that people did not have before they entered the hospital. Something to think about. Drugs have side effects. Many are addictive. More and more disease is becoming drug resistant. And in fact, some diseases, um, some infections actually spread in the presence of antibiotics. On the other hand, charcoal is safe, it's simple, it's affordable, accessible, and it's free of side effects. It's faith inspiring and easy. If I were in a hospital, I pray not, and I had a wound infection, I'd be asking for charcoal. They're not going to give it to you. <laughs> That's one thing they don't do. I wish they would do. They should get back to that. Um, but you can. You're the gatekeeper of your health, and you can decide and hopefully they would respect that. Um, it works on infections, bacteria. That's my definition of a truly God-made medicine. It's interesting. Now, when you think of world calamities today, do you have to look far? I mean, when this was done, the top of the list was tsunamis because we knew about that earthquake in Japan and, and you know, that was, what, last year? And we just had this hurricane right up here just a few weeks ago. They're still without power. The power failure, transport failure, they can't get gas, problems are taking place, lack of medical care, and um, it's pretty serious. You need to know what to do, right? If you can't get medical care and you want to know how you're going to take care of yourself, good to get 
knowledge. Does this look familiar to anybody? When this presentation was made, this was hot in the news Fukushima. at the time. Yes, this is Fukushima in Japan right after the earthquake. This is the nuclear reactor, the facility. Now, did you know that around the cooling systems on the extractors for these nuclear reactors, they have a bed of 12 tons of what? Activated charcoal. And specifically, charcoal made from coconut. They've tested different charcoals, and they found that coconut charcoal is the most efficient for absorbing radiation. So I wanted to show you that and say that since this has happened, Fukushima, the carbon world is rocking because governments are buying up charcoal like, like mad. And the charcoal um, industry is, is, is definitely seeing an increase in need and knowledge and, and also price is going up. Well, here's a doctor down in, she's still alive, she's getting up in age now. Uh, in the state of Georgia, she was the coroner, uh, medical examiner, I think she's retired now. She had this interesting thing to say. Charcoal has amazing healing properties. In fact, if I were stranded on a desert island and could only take one thing along to protect me from disease, infection, and injury, I would choose charcoal. That's pretty significant. What exactly is this charcoal, an activated charcoal? Okay, charcoal is burnt wood, or there's other things, coconut shell, peat. Um, the next slide shows you they make it from um, bamboo woods. And they, they can make it from coal, but it's much more messy and expensive. They don't tend to use it from coal. But if they don't have other things, they can do it. And they're, they're, they're using it in China that way. But um, these ovens, these used to be common in the United States. They're not as common anymore. But they're called beehive ovens. And they would make charcoal in these. Activated charcoal is when they take the charcoal and put high pressure steam and crack it even further and break it, break it, break it. It makes more higher surface uh, area on the charcoal. So one third of um, activated charcoal, a pound of that would be equal to more than a pound of just regular charcoal. They both work. You can go off a lightning struck tree and get charcoal and it would work. Um, but activated charcoal, that's what they mean by activated. They just processed it a little bit further to make it more um, adsorbent. Just to let you know, your lead pencils, that is a carbon. It's a carbon product. Charcoal is carbon. This one has its formula under great magnification. It's structured so that it's in layers of carbon rings and they just slide off your pencil. Diamonds are carbon. And its structure is more cage-like. You can see it there in the little picture. And it's the hardest substance mineral known on Earth. And charcoal is a carbon. And it doesn't really have a definite structure. But what it has is a lot of surface area. And it, if you could somehow unfold all of that, say I had a teaspoon of activated charcoal, and I was going to somehow spread it all out flat, see how much surface value I have, it would cover a complete football field, mm. one teaspoon. So it has tremendous surface area, and it grabs the poison to itself and holds on to it. It's very interesting. Food poisoning. The World Health Organization um, says that gastrointestinal infections cause 80% of all disease worldwide. Now, 50,000 die every day, 5,000 a day from just cholera. Has anyone here ever had cholera? No, okay. It's an intense infection, and you can die within 24 hours. 
Charcoal would definitely help you <laughs> if you had that. Um, these are some of the diseases, uh, infections that all have the common denominator of uh, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, and 90% um, of health and safety risks travelers suffer are preventable. At least 50% of world travelers will suffer a gastrointestinal infection. And all these, you know, these uh, diseases have this common denominator, all of which charcoal is known to relieve. Now here's an aside that is very interesting, just an aside. The colobus monkey, there are colobus monkeys in Africa, but they found this one colony that was thriving more than the rest, just healthy as can be and flourishing and their numbers are increasing. And they're thinking, now why is that group, they're red colobus monkeys and they're in Tanzania, and they thought, What's with these ones? How are they doing it? And they started just observing them. And do you know what they found? This was so fascinating. Some monkey figured out that if he ate charcoal, he wouldn't get the diarrhea that they all get when they're eating mango and almond leaves. There's a lot of mango and almond leaves in that area, which are actually very high in protein, but it had a side effect, it had a toxin in it that would give them a worse bellyache and diarrhea. So they wanted to eat the leaves, but they couldn't because it, it you know, was bothering their stomach. Well, some monkey figured it out, and that little thing in his mouth is a chunk of charcoal. <laughs> and they sit there and they nibble on this charcoal, and they don't have any problems, and they are thriving, they're healthy, and <laughs> so the charcoal people, the carbon people, found this information and thought it was so fascinating that even animals somehow figured this out. You don't have to go to Africa or Tanzania to get food poisoning, do you? Uh, you can go to your local Chinese restaurant. I shouldn't pick on the Chinese. That's just a famous old saying that everybody has said. Um, you can get food poisoning from your own kitchen, your in-law's kitchen, your brother-in-law's house. You ever had that where you go home and, or you, you're at home and your stomach is just killing you? And you're like, oh no, I, something's not settled with me and it hurts, doesn't it? And you're wondering, should I go to ER? Should I go to the emergency? Oh, I'll get through it, I'll just ride it out. And it really hurts, doesn't it? It can even make you vomit, it can even make you have diarrhea. But did you know that if you have that charcoal at home, powder or capsules or a tablet, all you have to do is take that in a glass of water in 10 to 15 minutes, you'd be fine. And you sleep the rest of the night. Fine. So you need to know that. Now, uh, Another slide here, bad water, yes, bad food, bad air, of course we know it cleans air, uh, infections, it certainly cures or helps get rid of infections, cholera, dysentery, insect bites, but look at this, <laughs> anyone heard of the anthrax? Oh, yeah. We certainly became aware of it in 2001 when we had that really big scare uh, around 9-11 time. Well, it's true, charcoal absorbs anthrax. So there you go, another reason why you'd want that stuff on hand. Um, it's interesting. Um, sometimes I have done this talk and had uh, someone come up. I, I don't think we're gonna have time, but I would invite you to come up and try it. Well, we don't have time to do that, so I just wanna show you that you just simply, you can take it in capsule form, you can take it in tablet form, you can take it in powder and mix it up in water. You, if you're gonna do the powder in the water, I use a, a, a mason jar, a canning jar, and put a lid on and shake it. Cause stirring it in can be quite messy. And if you've ever dealt with charcoal powder, it tends to float and spread everywhere, it makes a mess. So you just mix it up, 
Drink it down. Typically, if we're not feeling well, we'll use one tablespoon in a pint of water and drink that down. Drink it like a man, right? <laughs> it actually has no taste. If you were to close your eyes, you would not taste it. You might feel grit in your mouth, but there is no taste. A picture of my girlfriend, Kimberly Dinsley, instructing people in Uganda, Africa on charcoal. She asked for volunteers if they wanted to try, come and try some charcoal. Drink it down like a man. Not one man raised his hand and came up there to try the charcoal. All women, okay? All women. And then right up at the end, she said at the very end of the program, one man ventured. He thought, well, all the women are okay. I guess I can try it too. <laughs> so, yeah. Now, when you drink it in powder form and you're just drinking it down, you've heard of milk mustaches? Well, you've got a black mustache on that one. Um, yeah, it's quite funny. But did you know that charcoal was sold in the Sears and Roebuck catalog as a teeth, oh, an agent to whiten your teeth. It was, it was. And it works very nicely, I have to say. If you have charcoal powder in, and it gets rid of bacteria and it really cleans your teeth quite, quite nicely. And we've already mentioned baby colic. It works brilliantly on that. Um, it works very well for pink eye. Now you're thinking grit in my eye, charcoal in my eye. No, what you do is you would take one teaspoon in a pint of water, shake it up, and it's black at first. Sit it down on the counter and let it settle. All the charcoal drops to the bottom, and it almost seems clear on top. But the, there is microscopically still charcoal in that water. It's called gray, we call it gray water. That's the water you would drop into your eyes for an infection in your eye. Yeah. Don't, don't do it when it's black and gritty. You don't want that grit in your eye. It works for poison oak, poison ivy. It works for bee stings and insect and wasp stings. It works brilliantly for these things. But here's a story. Remember that slide I showed you with the palm tree and the island in the tropics? Agatha Thrash, Dr. Agatha Thrash's granddaughter, was bitten by hundreds of fire ants one day. Does anybody know what fire ants are? Oh, yeah. oh man. <laughs> Woo! You probably could die from the venom. She was bitten by hundreds of fire ants, screaming hysterically from the pain. Grandma, Dr. Thrash, knew exactly what to do, picked her granddaughter up, ran her into the bathtub, put the child in the bathtub water, and put in charcoal in the water. And she said within two minutes, her granddaughter stopped crying, everything was fine. Uh, it had neutralized the venom from those stings and was gone. She was fine. So that's something you want to know, isn't it? Snake bites, same thing. The venom in a snake bite, you want to have charcoal on hand. I don't go anywhere without charcoal anymore. Brown recluse spiders. Now, this is one of the worst spiders I think there is in the United States. You get bit by one of these, it turns your flesh into necrotic, gangrenous. It, it just rots, and you end up with amputation or lots and lots of uh, surgeries from uh, grafting. This is on day two after a bite. This is day nine. And day 10, he lost that thumb and a good part of his wrist. You would want to try charcoal immediately, right when you're bit, um, or as soon as you can afterwards. If you don't have charcoal, just as another aside, find some clay. Clay also absorbs poison and toxin out of tissue. Now, how do you make something that you're going to apply, right, on a bite or a sting or, or something or a wound that's infected? This is how you make a charcoal poultice. This is a one formula. There's others we could tell you about. One cup of water, 
three tablespoons of flaxseed, and I say three tablespoons of charcoal powder. Put it in a little saucepan and heat it up just till it gets, when it just starts to boil, you can take it off the heat, it's done. And the reason why you're putting the flaxseed in is so that it will hold together like a jelly because it, if it's just water, it, it dries out and goes back to its powder form. So this keeps it, holds in the moisture. And they're gonna make a mud paste out of it. And find something to use, a uh, paper towel works fine. Uh, it has to be kind of thick tissue, toilet paper would not work, it's too thin. This is probably a little sheet, a uh, cut up sheet, like a pillowcase sheet. And you want it wet because when it applies to your skin, it has to have a water bond with your skin. So you want it wet. Then you want to hold that moisture in. So you wrap it with some saran wrap and make sure it's all nice and in good contact with the area that's infected or poisoned or whatever. And then over that, you can cover it with something, a towel and a safety pin or an ace wrap works really nice. And um, best if you can keep it on overnight, eight hours while you sleep would be best. Um, if it's something real severe, you can just keep applying it. But do you know how your skin goes wrinkly when you have a bath too long? Your skin will, you know, you want to dry it out in between times, but you can apply it for a good eight hours, take it off, let it dry out, and then do another application. That's all human applications, but you can use it with your pets. It does help pets, too. They've been studying this, and they've been finding um, it's certainly saving pets' lives. Um, animals get into poisoning just like people do. And this dog here was the Dinsley's, is the Dinsley's, <laughs> he's still alive, is the Dinsley's dog. And uh, he got into, she got into some poisoning of something. And they knew what to do because they know about charcoal and the dog survived just fine. Happy dog, and they got himself into another, herself into another mess. She went and got herself all torn up by a barbed wire fence. Oh. Yeah, and you know, nasty, dirty barbed wire fence usually is going to have a wound infection with it. Well, these are charcoal people, so they knew what to do. They had their veterinarian shave and stitch her up, and then they put the charcoal poultice on over that and made sure that there was no infection that would set in there. And it healed up very quickly. When they went back to the veterinarian, the veterinarian said, wow, I didn't expect this to heal so clean and quickly. And they said, yes, we used charcoal. <laughs> now it helps for, uh, if anyone does cattle, it helps with scours. They've been testing it on animals and putting it in feed to see what it would do. And it increases milk production on cows somehow. It uh, reduces smell. And, you know, it's, it's helping pigs too. <laughs> it's increasing egg production with chickens. And um, it's interesting. They've even tried it on rats and found that it increased their lifespan somehow, just putting charcoal into them. Enough about animals, how about, anybody have a green thumb here? Ever heard of a green thumb? Well, how about a black thumb? You gotta see this next slide. This is so interesting. They're using it now in soil and just seeing what it does. And not only does it clean up soil, toxins in the soil, but it does something. And this is all the same corn planted in a row. This one has a special processed charcoal that they're trying to, you know, um, market. But this has no charcoal at all, and this just has standard charcoal, probably from your burnt fireplace. But isn't that interesting? All the same corn, and look what it does. So somehow it's helping with agriculture. So there you go. There's many different reasons why you might want to look into charcoal and know more about it and now you know some and which way do you go from here
I encourage you that some will say, does it matter? It doesn't matter. It does matter. It matters very much. It can be life or death. And I encourage you to keep learning um, all you can. The author, John Dinsley, is the one. This man created this talk. He is a charcoal specialist. He first started getting interested in learning a lot about charcoal and other natural remedies uh, from Dr. Agatha Thrash down in Georgia. And he started there and then he went out and he went all over the world being a missionary and he saw charcoal in action. He also had the opportunity to use charcoal in action in the jungles, out there in third worlds, and just gained a tremendous knowledge in it, and then was very much encouraged to go ahead and write a book. So he has started his own internet charcoal business, but he also wrote a book about his experiences and his knowledge. It's a very interesting book. The Complete Handbook of Medicinal Charcoal and Its Applications. That is a real website of his, charcoalremedies.com. You can go there. He has another website where he sells all his charcoal products, um, which is buyactivatedcharcoal.com. On my table, resource table, we have his business cards and his book. But he wrote this, uh, he put this presentation together. I had to the privilege of meeting him and his wife and hearing this presentation. And afterwards, I ran up to John and I said, that was awesome. This is, people have to know about this. We gotta tell people about this. We gotta give this talk. And he just looked at me <laughs> like, are you kidding? I'm too busy anyway. And I, I'm like, well, come on. People have to know about this. And he started smirking. And I go, if you don't give this talk, I will. <laughs> and he goes, you're on. And that is why I'm up here. <laughs> Just because I'm so excited about this interesting remedy.